nuclear attack on the United States could result in a great amount of damage. Many of our cities and military targets could be heavily damaged. However, even in an extensive attack, the total area affected by the blast and thermal effects would be fairly small in relation to the total area of the country. This would not be the case with radioactive fallout. The area affected by fallout would be many times larger than the area affected by the explosions. Radioactive fallout from enemy weapons could threaten life anywhere in the country. Radioactive fallout then could be a serious threat to almost everyone in the United States. Fortunately, protection against this threat can be achieved at comparatively little cost per person by intelligent community planning. To aid communities in planning and organizing protection against fallout, the Office of Civil Defense has set up a nationwide shelter program. The object of this program is to survey, mark, and provision existing public shelter spaces and develop enough additional shelters to protect the entire population against radioactive fallout in case of attack. Before attempting to select or identify shelters, however, we must first understand what constitutes adequate protection against fallout. Fallout from a nuclear cloud can be expected to settle on rooftops, lawns, fields, streets, trees, sidewalks, on any surface, in fact, where dust might collect. Of course, radioactive materials generally cannot be seen with the naked eye. Fallout is illustrated in this graphic to show it descending. From this fallout will come different kinds of radiation, the most dangerous of which is gamma rays. Gamma rays, like X-rays, are quite penetrating. They're also quite destructive to human tissue and may produce severe illness or death to anyone not properly shielded from them. And the danger increases in direct proportion to the length and amount of exposure, or in other words, the dosage. Since fallout may remain dangerous for a period of days or even weeks, a shelter must be able to provide enough protection so that its occupants will not accumulate a dangerous dose of radiation during their stay in the shelter. This ability to shield its occupants from radiation is known as a shelter's protection factor. A shelter having a protection factor of 100, for instance, means simply that a person inside the shelter will receive only one one-hundredth as much radiation as a person outside with no protection at all. If this man outside receives a dose of 800 rentgens in a given period of time, the man inside will receive only eight rentgens during the same period. In other words, the man outside would probably receive a fatal dose of radiation if received in a short time, while the man inside the shelter would be unharmed. Why? Because of the type and amount of material which lies between this man and the source of radiation. Generally speaking, any substance will offer some form of protection against radiation. But the heavier the substance, the greater the mass, the better the protection. The shielding quality of any material is directly related to its weight per cubic foot. That's why heavy, dense materials such as concrete or masonry provide much better protection than lightweight materials of the same thickness, such as wood or plaster. Even steel or glass have high shielding ability, but they're ordinarily used in such thin sheets that they provide very little actual protection. Earth or sand also provide good protection if the protective layer is thick enough. In short, the best shelter will be found where there is a large mass of heavy material between the occupants and the source of radiation. There are two principal types of fallout shelters, the family or home shelter and public shelter. In many rural areas, the family type shelter is the only practical one, since it's the only one which would be easily accessible to the people who need protection. Also in many rural areas, public shelter facilities are very limited. In some cases, existing structures are readily available, such as the tornado shelters, so often found on the farms of Kansas, Nebraska, and Oklahoma. Of course, protection against radiation must be provided for the doorways. In other cases, suitable shelters would have to be built, either in basements, if available, or in convenient locations nearby. However, public shelters have several advantages over family shelters. For this reason, the National Shelter Program is placing emphasis on identifying, modifying, or constructing public shelters. To locate and mark all suitable public shelter space, a nationwide survey has been conducted by specially trained architects and engineers. In towns and cities all over the country, these men have examined all types and kinds of buildings to determine exactly what space is available in existing structures. 
To be acceptable under the National Shelter Program, shelter space must meet the minimum protection factor required by the federal government. Such space is most likely to be found in the basements of banks, churches, stores, public buildings, or in the inner core of large substantial buildings such as hospitals, apartment houses, older type school buildings, or large office buildings. In many of these buildings, a surprising amount of space may prove to be suitable. In this building, for instance, not only the basement would provide excellent shelter, but also many of the upper floors. The two top floors, however, could be hazardous because of their proximity to the fallout which would settle on the roof. And the ground floor might not be usable because of the fallout collecting on the ground. Still, this building would have more than enough space to shelter all of the people normally living or working here. Suitable space can also be found in the outlying areas of cities, such as shopping centers, especially where there are basement selling or storage areas, in certain types of factory buildings in firehouses, and buildings are not the only places to look. Suitable shelters can also be found in mines, especially drift mines, where the shaft is driven into the side of a hill, or in caves, or in highway or railroad tunnels, or in subways. However, in some rural areas, shelters can also be found in wine cellars, such as those found in California or western New York State or in large potato cellars, such as those in southern Idaho. Of course, adequate protection against fallout must be provided for the entryway. We must remember that shelters are not strange or unique structures with mysterious protective qualities. Rather, they are regular, everyday structures which are all around us. What we must be able to do is recognize their ability to protect us. Size must also be considered. Is the space large enough to house the minimum number of people required by the government? Or is it too small to be approved as a public shelter? Then there is the matter of location. Is the space located in an area where shelter space is needed? Or is it too far from the people who will be expected to use it? And there are health factors. While the object of the shelter program must be survival rather than comfort, there are certain essential minimum health standards. Does the space have the ability to maintain bearable temperature and humidity conditions when filled to capacity? Is the air supply sufficient for the number of occupants? Even when inactive, people require fresh air. All of these factors, protection, size, location, health factors, must be considered when selecting space for shelter under the government survey. If suitable, the space is eligible for marking with the approved Civil Defense Shelter sign and for provisioning with the supplies furnished by the federal government. These include water and food supplies, medical kits, sanitation kits, and shelter radiation kits. However, the shelter space which will be identified through this nationwide survey will not be enough to accommodate all of the American people. Other space will have to be improved or constructed. One way that space can be made usable is by fairly simple modifications of existing buildings. Certain types of buildings, of course, lend themselves to modification more readily than others. A solidly constructed building, such as this, for instance, may have a good large basement which needs only to have certain unnecessary windows bricked up to make it an excellent shelter space. Or this well-built hospital may very well have a basement which would provide ample shelter space. Or if a baffle wall were constructed in front of an outside doorway or opening to serve as a shield or barrier against radiation, the space within could serve as a shelter. Also, additional shelter space can often be provided by expanding the capacity of existing shelters. In some cases, it may be possible to double the capacity of a shelter simply by installing a fan to provide a greater flow of air. In other cases, it may be possible to brick up unnecessary doors leading into rooms and thereby increase the amount of protected and usable space in the hall. Some buildings, on the other hand, do not lend themselves to modification which will produce suitable shelter space. These include modern one-story school buildings which have large glass areas and no basements 
modern one-story factory buildings, and the average motel. In all such buildings, it would be difficult and costly to provide adequate protection against fallout collecting on the roof and ground. In any case, we must remember that protection is a relative thing. And even substandard space, which does not fully meet the government requirements regarding size, ventilation, or protection factor, may still be useful in an emergency and should not be forgotten. Whatever the difficulties, the goal of each community should be the same, to provide adequate protection against fallout for every man, woman, and child. Until this goal is met, no community can be said to have an adequate shelter program. Remember, Fallout is a real and serious threat as long as there is a threat of a nuclear war. But fallout is one threat which we can do something about. By cooperating wholeheartedly with the National Shelter Program, by helping to improve or increase the shelter space in our towns and cities, we can help to ensure not only our own survival, but the survival of our families, our communities, and our nation.